Why was Jesus given to the world? Of course, we who are of sincere faith, we would immediately answer that question that Jesus was given to the world to save the world from sin. And if that is the answer that you would give to me, I would certainly tell you that you are not wrong. But you know how I am. If you have listened to me over the years, if you have followed me throughout the years, you know that in my Bible study, I don't like to just live with the simple answer. I love for us to have full knowledge. And so with that in mind, I love to take a deep dive into scripture and pour over the scripture so that we can have a, a fuller understanding behind questions and answers like that. Yes, the Lord, he gave us his only begotten son to save us from sin so that we do not perish, but so that we can have everlasting life. Yes, that is very true. But the Lord, he needed. Okay. I want you to understand me clearly here. When I say this, God needed to give the world his only begotten son. So why did the Lord need? Why did the Lord have to give the world his only begotten son? Well, the answer to that question goes all the way back to when the Lord created my, mankind. When we go back to the first chapter of Genesis and we look at the Lord creating mankind, scripture tells us very plainly that the Lord, he created us in his image and in his likeness. Do you know why it is that the Lord created us, mankind, in his image and in his likeness. Why didn't he create the animals in his image and in his likeness? Why didn't he create the plant life in his image and in his likeness? Why, why were we? Why are we so special that God created us in his image and in his likeness? Well, the answer to that question can be seen there in the garden. When you take a look at Adam and Eve in the garden, the Lord, he not only kept watch over what Adam and what Eve were up to in the garden, when they sinned in the garden prior to, to, to them running and trying to hide from God, the Lord, they could hear him moving in the garden, which would signify that, that the Lord, he dwelt with mankind in the garden. He was among them in the garden. And so God, he created mankind in his image and in his likeness because the Lord desired to dwell with us. When we were created in his image and in his likeness, we were created in his holiness and in his righteousness. We had glory. What that means is that we were without sin. So we were perfect. When God created us, he did not create us as sinful creatures. We were created as, as perfect creatures. And so the Lord, he was able to dwell with us because, again, we were holy and we were righteous. But after mankind fell in the garden, man sinned, right? Man disobeyed God in the garden. Adam and Eve, they ate from the tree in which they were forbidden. They were instructed by God not to eat from the tree in the midst of the garden. They were not supposed to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but they did so anyway. And again, many of us, we like to to put the fault on the devil for, for deceiving Eve. But again, the choice was on Adam and Eve. They ate from the tree that they were instructed by God not to eat from. So they disobeyed knowing exactly what they were doing, which again was a transgression against God. That was them acting out in disobedience. And so after they acted out in disobedience, the Lord, he pushed them out of the garden. They were evicted. They were exiled. If you've been listening to or watching the recent Sunday school lessons, then you're familiar with this statement that I'm using here. They were exiled from the garden, never allowed to be able to come back in. And man, we lived separated. We were apart from the Lord. There was a barrier between us and the Lord. That barrier being our sin. The Lord will not he will not ever dwell with sin. But God, even though we were set apart from the Lord because of sin, the Lord, he still watched over us, even though he would not dwell with us. He still continued to watch over, over mankind. 
Even in the days of Noah, when, when mankind was living in great sin, the Lord still reached out to mankind and Noah heeded his voice. He heeded the Lord's instructions and, and he was saved from the great flood. Even after the days of Noah, when mankind again was still living in sin, there was at least one that chose to heed the voice of God. And that was Abraham. Abraham lived obediently to the Lord's voice and because of his obedience, God made a covenant with Abraham, right? And that covenant, it was passed down to Isaac. And from Isaac, it was passed down to Jacob. And from Jacob, it was passed down, passed onward to, to his sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. And so again, when Israel found themselves living in the bondage of Egypt, the Lord, he still would heed their cries and he sent to them Moses, right? And so Moses led the children of Israel out from the bondage of Egypt. He led them to Mount Sinai, where we see the Lord. He has this desire, which again becomes very evident what it is that God desires. He desires to dwell with mankind. Still, even after, after sin, after transgression and, and trespassing against the Lord, the Lord still has this grand desire to, to dwell with you and me, to dwell with, with mankind. And so in the book of Exodus, in the 19th chapter, we'll see where the Lord, he speaks with Moses and, and he has the desire to make a covenant to give Israel his law for Israel to live by. And so that's where our Bible study really kicks off at with the fact that, that the Lord gave Israel his law to live by. We need to understand the purpose as to why he gave Israel the law to live by. And we need to know what it was that Israel did when they made this covenant with the Lord, when they received his law to live by. So we're going to go over that here in our Bible study for this week. What I want to do here today, I'm not going to jump immediately into all of our focus scripture for today, but what I want to do is at least bring up the key verse for today. Because again, we, we have knowledge that the Lord gave Israel his law, but we'll see here in my key verse uh, something that is a failure. And I want you to understand when I say this is not the law's failure. The failure is actually on us mankind. So I want us to take a look at the eighth chapter of the book of Romans and we'll take a look at the third verse. This verse is going to serve as my key verse for our study this week. Again, we are taking a look at why Jesus was given to the world. Yes, we know that he was given to save the world from sin, but the Lord, as I said at the start, needed to give the world his only begotten son. So we'll see there. In the eighth chapter of Romans in the third verse there that Paul wrote for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. And I'll take that fourth verse as well. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. So why did the Lord need to give the world his only begotten son? Paul, he says there in the third verse that it seems to, to deal with the law, right? Again, just take a close look at that third verse. He says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh God did by sending his own son. So the law, you know, if we, if we just glance at that verse, we would think that there was something wrong with the law, right? Because again, Paul said that the law was unable to do something in that it was weak through the flesh. Now, this this thought could be a cause of concern for, for those that try to live by the law. Is Paul saying that the law itself is weak? No, he's not necessarily saying that. 
we need to understand what it is that or why it is that God gave the children of Israel the law in the first place. And so at this point, let's certainly turn over now to the 19th chapter of the book of Exodus. And when we get over to the 19th chapter of the book of Exodus, I want us to take a look at it should be around about the fifth or sixth order. Let's take a look here. I want us to take a look at the, the fifth verse. That's again in the 19th chapter of the book of Exodus. And we'll see there in the fifth verse that the Lord says here, he says, now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my commandment, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. This is again, God directing this message to the children of Israel because the children of Israel was who the Lord was making the covenant with. He is giving Israel. He desires to give Israel his law. That's what we see there in the fifth verse there. Now, when we take a look at the sixth verse, we'll see that the Lord said to Israel, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Okay. So again, just take a look there again at the, the fifth and the sixth verse there in the 19th chapter of the book of Exodus. And we'll see what it was that the Lord, or why it was that the Lord gave Israel his law, what it was that he desired from the children of Israel to be if they lived obediently and kept his law, kept true to the covenant that, that he and the children of Israel were coming into. Again, there in that fifth verse, we'll see that it says, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, live in obedience to the law. Okay. He said, you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. So they will be set apart sanctified, if you will, from all people. All right. And then again, there in the sixth verse, you shall be to me a kingdom of priest and a holy nation. Okay. So for us to, to fully understand this, the Lord desire for Israel by living in obedience to his law to become a kingdom of priests. Now, what's the role of, of priests, right? Priests, yes, we see that they're supposed to be a special treasure, but that's the significant part, they're the priest. So let's, let's focus on that for, for a second here. What is the role of the priest? Yes, we would say, well, the priests, they are the religious leaders. So the priests, yes, we know they are the spiritual leaders, right? So they were to serve as an example, all right? If they lived in obedience, if they kept the covenant, they were to serve as an example, as a holy nation to all people. They weren't supposed to be like the rest of the world. We would say Gentiles. They were to be sanctified by living in obedience to the law of God. And by living in obedience to the law of God, they would have been serving as spiritual leaders to the rest of the world. The rest of the world would be able to look at Israel living in obedience to the law of God. And the rest of the world would be able to follow their example and become holy and righteous as well. But there was a problem here. And I want you to understand that the problem was not with the law. The problem was actually with the people. And I'm not saying that Israel was a problem. Let me, let me make that point very clear here. The problem essentially is with mankind in that in our nature, our nature is to disobey. Our nature is to, to not live by anybody's will, but our own will. We want to, follow our own heart. And that's what got Israel. They, they said to the Lord in this 19th chapter in coming in agreement to, to, the, to the covenant that they had come to with the Lord. They said, yes, all of this sounds good. We will keep the covenant that we, um, that we have made with, with you or that you have made with us. Right. But as soon as Moses went up into Mount Sinai and he went up into the mountain to, to, of course, receive the stone tablets from the Lord. He was up in Mount Sinai for 40 days, 40 nights is what scripture tells us. Israel, within that time frame, 
they broke the covenant that they made with the Lord. What did Israel do? Israel, they made themselves a calf of gold and they worshiped the calf of gold. When they weren't supposed to have any other guys before them, Israel made themselves a God and they bowed down and they worshiped this calf of gold. They broke the covenant. They went against the law. They were disobedient. And so they failed the law. The law is very difficult for, for one to keep. And that's why Paul there again, turning all the way back over, we can turn back over now. I've used the, the 19th chapter there. Let's turn back over again and read that third verse with this understanding in mind. It's not the problem. The law is not the problem. The law itself is not weak. It is us. It is mankind who's, who is weak because no matter what, no matter how hard we may try to fight it, our nature is to, to sin. Our nature is to, to follow our own will where we should be trusting in the Lord's will, where we should be obedient to God's will. We just have it within us to, to disobey. We are the weak ones, not the law. We may fight it. No matter how much we fight it, we will eventually give in to temptation. That means that we will fall into error. That's all people, believers and non-believers. We all fall short of the glory of God. We are not perfect. Okay. And so with that in mind, we again, take a look at that third verse. And Paul, he said there again, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. It is weak through our flesh. The law doesn't have flesh. It is weak through our flesh because we are the ones who will fall into temptation. Okay. So for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. Why did God need to give his only begotten son? Why did God need to give the world Jesus? He gave the world his only begotten son on account of sin. Our, our ability to fall into sin is the reason why God gave his only begotten son. So again, I just want to make it very clear. All right. The law itself is not weak. All right. We are the ones who are weak. We would fail in one part of the law. And in doing that, we will fail the law in its entirety. I'll get to that verse there again. That's some of James will We'll touch on that here in a moment. So as we continue to look here at scripture, the next question that I suppose would arise would come from what Paul says in the 10th chapter of Romans and the fourth verse for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, over the years, that statement there, Jesus is the end of the law, that has been a statement that I have made that have caused people to frown. And some have even grown upset with the notion, the, the very idea that Jesus is somehow the end of the law. They say, well, Jesus didn't destroy the law. The law, the law is, the law can't be destroyed. It that statement, it, it draws that thought that somehow Jesus destroyed the law. But Jesus himself said that, that he didn't come to destroy the law. When we turn over to the second chapter of Mark's gospel, let's turn over here real quick to the second chapter of Mark's gospel. When you get there, if you're turning with me, I want you to take a look at the 17th verse and we'll read this verse together where Jesus said there, those who are well, they have no need of a physician, but those who are sick and Jesus, he said, I did not come to call the righteous. I came to call the sinners to repentance. And of course I added a few words in there because I like to dress that, that verse up. So much. I, I've shared this verse a lot over the years because I want people to 
to have some understanding of, of what it was that Paul was saying there. When again, Paul said that Jesus is the end of the law and Jesus would actually somewhat agree with him. Paul, he said, or Jesus said there, those who are well, they have no need of, of a physician, but those who are sick, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Well, who is it that is righteous in the world today? The only ones who can strive to be righteous and will one day be righteous are all of those who are of sincere faith, all of those who walk according to the word of God, all of those who strive to live in obedience to the word of God. There is no other way that anybody can come become righteous in the world. You can't become righteous on your own merits if you're not living in obedience to the word of God. There are many people in the world today that like to think that they are righteous, but they are only righteous in their own minds. They are living just as any other sinner, as any other person that chooses to live in disobedience to the word of God. They're living just as, as they would. Jesus, I want you to understand that he came to the world to call on all people to repent because all of us are sinners. All of us, again, Every single person walking this earth that walked it in the past, those that will come after us. All people are sinful people. We have the nature of sin in us. OK, so he Jesus points out there that he came to the world because mankind was in need of of healing. We were in need of healing, not just physically, like we think of the, the physical miracles that that Jesus performed, but we were in need of a spiritual healing as well. So Jesus needed to come to the world to heal us spiritually. Now, for more confirmation as to what Paul said there in the 10th chapter of Romans and the fourth verse, let's turn over to the, the fifth chapter of Matthew's gospel. And I want to, to, to take a look at what Jesus said in the fifth chapter of Matthew's gospel and the 17th verse. And, and Jesus, I want you to understand that he was saying these words to the disciples. He said this uh, at the sermon on his sermon on the Mount. He said here, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. He didn't come to destroy the law or the, or the prophets. And Paul wasn't saying that Jesus destroyed that, like he tore up that he burnt up or he wasn't, Paul didn't say that. What Paul was saying was what Jesus said here in the 17th verse, right there at the end of it, where Jesus said, I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So again, look closely at that 17th verse so that you can understand exactly what Paul meant by, by his statement in the 10th chapter of Romans and the fourth verse. Jesus, he again said, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy. He did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. So some may begin to wonder, why does the law need to be fulfilled, right? Again, Paul, he said that Jesus was the, the end of the law. Jesus essentially was the fulfilling of the law. Like I like to say, if I had to liken the law to, to a book, I would say, yeah, this was the law. You know, this, this part here was the law. And then Jesus was this last part of it. He was the, the conclusion of the law. And so some of, some of us may begin to wonder, well, why does the law need a conclusion? Some of us, we, we may begin to wonder, well, is the law not enough? Was, was the law not enough for us? Well, again, we, we have the thought already in mind from the eighth chapter of Romans and the third verse where Paul said, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son. So we already have that in mind. But what I want to do now is I want us to, now dive into my focus scripture for this study. Let us now turn over to the seventh chapter of Romans here. And let us now read from the seventh verse down through the 15th verse. Because again, we need to understand why the Lord needed 
to give the world his only begotten son. It deals with, yes, the law, but as we have seen so far, a lot of it deals with, with us and, and our sin in that we are unable to, to completely fulfill the law. And again, I haven't forgot about James. Uh, I'm going to reference James uh, here in a moment, but I want to dive into uh, this scripture here from the seventh chapter of Romans. In the seventh verse that Paul, he wrote, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Okay. Is, is there something wrong with the law? Is the law bad in that? Again, we have seen that the law is weak through the flesh. Paul, his answer there in the seventh verse was certainly not. In fact, we'll see Paul say there in the seventh verse, on the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not, or I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Keep that seventh verse in mind. Okay, keep that in mind as we as we go throughout this scripture, because Paul, he points out that there's nothing bad about the law. Again, it, it's on us. But one of the good things about the law, Paul points out, is that we would not know right from wrong if, if it wasn't for the law. We know what it is that pleases the Lord because of the law. Right. For example, we know that it is good for us to, again, serve only a God. We know, again, for example, it is good for us to honor our parents, our fathers and our mothers, right? We know that it is good for us to treat our neighbors in a manner that is out of love because of the law, because God gave us, uh, he gave us his law. We know right from wrong. We, we know, as Paul said there, that it's not good for us to covet anything, not to covet anything of our neighbors. We, we shouldn't covet what others have. So we know that that is not right for us to do because the law, because God gave his law. So again there, he said, on the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law has said, you shall not covet. We'll see there in the a verse. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. That is, that without the law, we would not know right from wrong. We would be living in a manner of ignorance. We would be, in a manner of speaking, living in bliss. We would be living happily because we would be going out and we wouldn't be living with a conscience of, again, right from wrong. So we would go out and we would live in sin. And, and many of us, because we, because of sin and because of our desire to give in to temptation, many of us would say, man, we're having a wonderful time. We're having a great time living, living in this sinful manner. We wouldn't have known that it was sin if the law was not given to us by the Lord. So again, we'll see there in the ninth verse, Paul said, I was once alive. Okay. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and, and I died. The, the law. Okay. I'm, I'm going to stop right there. I'm not even going to keep reading. I want, I really want to touch on, on this point here because this ninth verse, what, what Paul mentions here in this ninth verse, it, it, it speaks to what the law actually does to, to mankind. The law, it points out our wrongdoings and it, it points it out over and over and over and over again. That is what the law do. You see, without the law, we wouldn't know right from wrong. Paul, like he said there again in the same verse, he, he knows not to covet anything from, from anyone, right? He knows that covetousness is wrong, but without the law, it wouldn't have been wrong, you know, in Paul's mind, hey, it's okay for me to go out in, in the covet and to lust after what others have. I can do that. I can do that happily. But now that, that I know the law, I can't live in that ignorance. You see, a lot of people, they, they want to, they desire to live in that ignorance. 
but so many people know the 10 commandments. And, and I want to say right away that the 10 commandments, that's not the law itself. The 10 commandments are part of the law. The law is made up of many statutes that, that the Lord gave to the children of Israel for which they were to live by. We don't live up under the law today. Okay. And we're going to touch on this, this point near the end of our study, but I, I do want to put this out here now. We live under the grace of God. We know that we are to love the Lord with our whole hearts. And in that love, we know that we are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And so by any means that we mistreat someone, by any means where, where we wrong those that are around us, whether they are a loved one and a, a, a good friend or an acquaintance or a stranger, when we do wrong by them, then we know that we are acting out of character. We know that, that we are being disobedient, just like fornication and adultery and, and things like that. We know what is, is wrong and what it, what it is that pleases the Lord. We know that today. Okay. So we are in that much different boat than what Paul was saying here, because again, we can't claim to the Lord that we were ignorant or that we did not know when we was doing wrong. There are many people today that would love to be able to say to God, I didn't know. They would love to be, to, to, to play like the, the puppy dog and, and give the Lord the, the puppy eyes saying, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know that was wrong, but we can't do that. The law would point out your sin and it would point it out over and over and over again. Now I'm going to touch on, on the thought of, 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 where the law, where we need Jesus here in a moment. I, I want to continue to read through the scripture here. We'll read now from the 10th through the 15th verse there, where in the 10th verse, Paul, he said, and the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. All right. We're really going to touch on that verse in a moment there as well. Said there in the 11th verse for sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it killed me. The 12th verse says, therefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Nothing is wrong with the law. Like we said, the, the problem with the law is actually with us, not the law itself. We are the ones that would give in to temptation. The law itself, the law cannot sin. We have to remember that the law came from the Lord. So therefore, the law itself is holy and righteous. As Paul said there, the law is holy, just, and good. Now there in the 13th verse, we'll see that Paul said, has then what is good become death to me? Is, is, is the law, is it now death to me? Paul is saying there. He says there in, in response to his question, certainly not, but sin that it might appear sin was producing death in me through what, it, what is good so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. Sin, okay, him, him giving in to sin was what was turning around and making it seem like the law was a terrible thing because the law was just saying, hey, that you've done wrong. That is a sin. You've done wrong, okay? And so he said there in the 14th verse, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. That word carnal, we have focused on that word quite a bit in recent months. Do you know what it means to be carnal? Well, to be carnal means that you are worldly. And, and let's be very clear about this as well. All people, all people are carnal. But there is a difference between the believer and, and those who do not believe, those who are not of faith. And again, it goes back to the word that I used a, a few minutes ago when I was talking about being sanctified. We are sanctified by the blood of Jesus, which we are going to again touch on in a moment. So while that old man is still present within us, while that carnal nature is still present within us, you and I as sincere believers, we have received the Holy Spirit, which again, we're going to touch on that a little bit more in a moment. So Yes, Paul, what, what he admits to there when he says that he is carnal, he's essentially saying it out of humility that his old man is still present. 
And so Paul was stating there that he is not perfect. Like, like how you often will hear and see me uh, say and do, uh, I tell you all all the time that I am not perfect. And, and I know that, that there are going to be some who watches these videos or who listens to the podcast. And they'll say, man, why is this pastor, why is this preacher always talking about how he is not perfect? That is my humility. And, and I don't want anyone to think that, that I am perfect or that I'm trying to portray myself in being perfect. I strive to live in obedience to the word of God, and I do my very best to live by his word. But even then, I am still a creature that will sin. I will give in to temptation, which requires me to to then go to the Lord, because I desire not to, to suffer the punishment of sin. I desire to make my home in the everlasting kingdom of the Lord, which again, we'll see here that the law, it points to the need of Jesus. All that we have read here so far from the seventh verse down through uh, the 14th verse, we will see that the law points to the need of Christ. Okay. The law points to the need of Christ because we are fallible creatures. We're not infallible. We are fully capable of of failing. And so what the law points out in that we sin repeatedly is that we need help, that we need assistance. Okay. And so in the 15th verse, Paul, he said, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For For what I will to do that I do not practice, but what I hate that I do. Again, Paul just making an admission here. What is it that Paul willed to do? Well, Paul, he desired to live for the Lord. As we have been discussing in our recent Sunday school lessons, Paul, he had a God first mindset. Again, Paul said for to live is Christ. So he had a heaven focused mindset and and he desired to live for the kingdom of heaven. But that old nature in him would creep back up at times. How many of you have your old nature creep back up at time and like to whisper sweet nothings in your ear and say, Hey, it's okay for you to go off and do that. The Lord won't see you. You know, we, we, we often have that whispering going on in our ears. You, you may recall how I recently said, we have to be careful about those signs and those feelings that we be praying about because the devil loves to dabble in those feelings and those signs. The devil loves, I want you to understand the devil loves to whisper sweet nothings in your ear to make, you know, some of those things that we know ain't good for us to do, to try and make it seem like it ain't that bad. That's exactly what the devil did to Eve in the garden. And so Paul, with with the mission there in the 15th verse, was essentially saying, look, I will to do what is holy and righteous. I, 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 I desire to live in obedience, but my old sinful nature, it, it, it always happened to come back up and and cause me to stumble. It causes me to fall over into sin. Which again, when we take a look at the eighth chapter of Romans and the third verse, is what Paul was getting at there. Where again, he said, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son. What, what Paul is, is saying there is that he was fully capable of, of falling down into sin, just like everybody else. We are fully capable of falling down in sin. And so Paul, in this desire, he's pointing out that he needs help in order to be able to fulfill the law. In other words, Paul is saying, I need help. You need help. All of us as believers who who desire to do what is holy and who desire to do what is right in the eyes of God, we need help and being able to live in obedience. We, we need help in being able to fulfill what it is that the law desires out of the world, out of mankind. Yes, the Lord, he gave the law to the children of Israel. But again, I want to be very clear about this. Even though we don't live under the law and even though we live under grace, Jesus said that he fulfilled the law. And so the law, again, what we saw in its desire is that the law, when fulfilled, it would make us 
a, again, a nation of, of holy priests. We will be a kingdom of priests, I should say there. We will be like spiritual leaders, which we are supposed to be in this world today. Again, when I get to being sanctified, we'll talk about that in a moment as well. But we are supposed to be, be stewards of the Lord. So the law in pointing to the fact that we need assistance, that, that we need help, we find that something also becomes obvious there. And what Paul was saying there in the seventh, chap the seventh chapter, Paul was saying that the law, it points out sin. But again, there, when we look back up at that 10th verse, Paul, he said that the commandment, which was to bring life, it was to make people holy and righteous to, to be a kingdom of priests, right? That's what we saw it was intended to, to be for the children of Israel. Paul, he said that he found it to bring death. There was no forgiveness in the law. The law, it pointed out sin over and over and over again, but there was no release. There was no, no, no reprieve. There was no forgiveness in the law. And we find Paul say this over in the 13th chapter of Acts. I'm going to turn over there real quickly and, and read from the 13th chapter for you there. In the 13th chapter of Acts, in the 38th verse, we'll see where Paul, he said there in the 38th verse, he said, therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man, he's talking about Christ there, is preached to you the forgiveness of sin. Through Christ, again, why was Jesus needed? Why did God need to give Jesus to the world? He needed to be the conclusion of the law. Again, the law, it pointed out our sin. If one could fulfill the law, they could become holy and righteous. Okay, let's be very clear on that point. But again, and here's where I'll turn over to James. I want to turn over to the first chapter of James. And I want to, I want to show you what James said here in scripture. Let's see here. It's actually in the second chapter of James and there in the 10th verse where in the second chapter of James, I'm sorry, I kept saying the first chapter, the second chapter of James in the 10th verse, we'll see where James said, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one part, he is guilty of all. So if you fail in one part of the law, you end up being guilty in all of the law, which again, it points to the need of the fact that we need assistance, that we need help to be able to fulfill God's law. And again, when we turn over to the 13th chapter of Acts, Paul, he speaks about again, how there was no forgiveness in the law, but again, Christ was preached who forgiveness comes through as well. Again, there in the 38th verse, the book of Acts there in the 13th chapter, it says, therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sin. The 39th verse says, and by him, everyone who believes is justified. It is, we are, are forgiven and found to be right, found to be just, is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. There is again, no forgiveness in the law of Moses. That is talking about the Mosaic law. Let us take a look here again at this eighth chapter. Really what I want to do, I kind of want to touch on the, the 20, first verse there as well in the seventh chapter. Let's take a look at the 21st. And now what I'll do is I'll read from the 21st chapter of the seventh chapter of Romans. And I'll read up to about the second verse in the eighth chapter of Romans. Paul, he writes there, I find then a law that evil is present with me. The one who wills to do good. Again, just what we've been discussing here throughout the study as well. Paul, again, just humbly admitting what, what lies within him, that old nature. 
said there in the 22nd verse, it said, for I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man in his heart and in his soul. He said again that he delight in the law of God. But there in the 23rd verse, he said, I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. That is, again, the law of his heart, which, again, was the law of God, which he desired to do. He said there again in the 23rd verse and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. There in the 24th verse is a humble acknowledgement. Again, Paul never for one second portrayed himself to be perfect. He had that humility to know exactly who he was. He said there in the 24th verse, he said, O wretched man that I am. How many of us, how many of us would say that about ourselves? I said, like I said, I said all the time, I'm not ashamed. I know, I know my sins, at least most of them, right? I, I know when I do wrong. He said, O oh, wretched man that I am. And then he asked, who will deliver me from this body of death? Which again, it points to our need of Christ. Again, if, if you truly do desire the Lord, that means that you desire his holiness, his righteousness. You desire to go to heaven. And, and none of us should be ashamed to, to admit that. I asked this question at church recently and everybody said, hey, I want to go to heaven. And I don't blame, I'm not ashamed of that. I live in obedience to the word of God. I fear God's wrath, his punishment, because I want to go to heaven. And I'm going to do my very best to live according to his word because I want to go to heaven. What about you? I hope that you desire to go to heaven. He said, Again, who would deliver me from this body of death? And then there in the 25th verse, it said, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself served the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. There, we turn over to the eighth chapter and the first verse, Paul, he said, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. This again is why God needed to give the world his only begotten son. God gave the world his only begotten son because there is forgiveness. There is mercy in his only begotten son where there is no mercy in the law. The law, if you try to live by the law without Christ, the law is just going to beat you over the head with the fact that you are a sinner. And you can't lift your hand up and say, hey, law, pick me up, because the law isn't going to do that. There is no forgiveness in the law. The law is, is again, it is holy and righteous. We may look at the law like it is a terrible thing because the law is going to point out the harsh truth that we are sinners, that we aren't perfect. The law is going to tell us that over and over and over and over again. But this is where Jesus steps in for us on behalf of the law. And Jesus, he is the one that stretches his hand outward and say, son or daughter, look, take my hand and I will lift you up from sin. All you have to do is trust in me. So how many of us are willing to trust in Christ? Because again, in Christ, there is no condemnation. We live under grace. Again, like I've been saying, we are sanctified by the blood of Jesus. By Christ, Christ again, he fulfilled the law. And so through our faith in him, we too are able to fulfill the law to where we can be set apart. That was what the Lord desired for the children of Israel. If they were able to live in obedience to, again, his law. Some of us, we may begin to wonder, well, if it was so impossible for Israel to live by the law, why did, why did God give them the law in the first place? Was the Lord trying to trick, trick Israel? That's what some of us would go down the line saying. God wasn't trying to trick Israel. He desired for them to be holy and righteous. But as I said before, what the law does point out 
about us, mankind, is that we are fallible creatures. We aren't perfect, that we need help, that we need assistance, and that help, that assistance, it comes from the Lord. You can't turn to somebody else and become holy and righteous. No amount of money that you have in your bank can make you holy and righteous. That's what Jesus told to the rich young ruler. Your possessions, you can have a great amount of wealth. That is not going to make you holy and righteous. It's not going to get you into heaven. You must again turn to the Lord. You must trust in him. So we live under grace. Yeah, because we live under the grace of God, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, to those who sincerely and truly are living in fellowship with Christ, there is no condemnation. But those who are outside of that, those who are outside of Christ, yes, there's always going to be condemnation for the sinner. So again, there he said, therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Then there in the second verse, Paul, he wrote for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The Holy Spirit we have received because of Christ. Again, we talk about why the Lord needed to give the world his only begotten son. Well, Jesus, he came to the world. He gave us the rebuke of God, that we are sinners, that we have fallen short of the glory of God, that we need to turn to him, that we need to repent from our wicked ways, that we need to trust in the Lord, have faith in his only begotten son. Jesus, after his death, he rose again from the grave and he went back home. He went back to, to sit at the right hand of God. But prior to his death, Jesus, he told the disciples in the 16th chapter that, that he needed to die and that he needed to, again, eventually go back home, that he needed to go away so that we can receive the helper, the comforter, the, the spirit of truth, that is the Holy Spirit who guides us into all truth. Here in this second verse, Paul, he speaks essentially about how the spirit and Christ, how they both work in unison. They, they both work together. For us, right? You see, without the Holy Spirit, we would be lost still. We, we would not know necessarily right from wrong. That's what Jesus explained to the disciples in the 16th chapter of John's gospel. He said to them, you can't understand what I'm saying to you now, but you eventually will because the Holy Spirit, he's going to guide you into the knowledge of all truth. In the Holy Spirit today, he serves in that role for all sincere believers. All sincere believers, we receive the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit guides us into the knowledge of all truth according to the Lord and his word. When you and I, when we get off track, when we, when we get away from the word of God, the Holy Spirit pulls us back in. Some of us, we, we, we do our best to disregard the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is on our other shoulder saying, hey, that's wrong. Turn back. Where again, our old man is on this shoulder saying, hey, no, you, know, you keep on going. The Holy Spirit is over there saying, no, 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 don't do that. Don't have those, those thoughts. Don't act out on those thoughts. Don't do that. The Holy Spirit is what keeps us in check. And, and again, we ought to, again, as Paul said at the end there, uh, the seventh chapter of Romans, we should be grateful for, for God today. Because again, in his love, he gave us his only begotten son because we need him. None of us can become holy and righteous by our own merits. We don't have the might. We don't have the power to become holy and righteous by anything that we do on our own. Again, we are saved by grace, by the grace of God, not by any of our own works. That is the gift of God. That's what Paul said. And so we celebrate Christ. We celebrate his birth this season. And during the, holy, the holidays, the holy seasons, I love to always try to teach and try to preach to the reasons. I do it all year long, but I really try to amp it up during the holiday seasons. 
to, to point out the purpose, the reason for the season. And the reason for the season is again, Christ. Christ was given to us because we need him in order for us to one day become holy and righteous so that we can live on with the Lord as he desires. God desires, God, again, he wants to live with you eternally. And so you have that opportunity today to do just that, to live in his heavenly kingdom. All you have to do is heed the rebuke of God. That is, you must turn away from sin and live in repentance. When you do this, heaven will be your home. All thanks to Christ giving his life for all of us, becoming our propitiation. And as we saw in the 10th chapter of, of Romans last week, or in Hebrews, I should say, we have a, a high priest who is compassionate towards us and, and sympathizes with us. He knows our plight. He understands what we go through. And again, we are able to find mercy. We are able to find forgiveness in his eyes because again, the Lord, he loves us. Okay. So that is our study for this week. That is why God gave us his only begotten son. He gave us his only begotten son. Yes so that we can be saved. So I hope that you enjoyed this study and I hope that you will share this study with somebody somewhere. That is the last study. This is going to be the last study of this year. We'll be back in the month of January, probably the second week in January will be our return date. So be on the lookout for our next Bible study that will be in the month of January. I hope that all of you have a wonderful Christmas and I hope that all of you have a happy new year as well. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you're following here on YouTube so that you don't miss a Bible study, so that you don't miss a sermon, Sunday school lesson, or a food for thought. Take a moment, follow today.